Let me begin. The headsets are available. Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm Claire LePoust. I was asked to moderate this roundtable meeting. When you're out there in the field conducting a news review, a documentary, what impact? Do you dream of having an impact? Is this the utopian or is it real? I'm a producer. Some years ago I wrote um, Au Parleur to give a voice to French speakers in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Maghreb. The idea being to allow them to express their views in the, out there in the field. And allowing young people to learn to tell about stories that mean something to them, and that's what you'll be doing here. You'll each tell us about your own story with your own passion, your reality as well, your truth, and concrete examples to illustrate what you all give and do and what impact it has. First of all, introduce yourselves, maybe Diala first. Roland and Yassine. So introduce yourselves and the media or organization that you represent. And then we'll get down to the nitty gritty. Hello, everyone. I'll be speaking in Arabic if you allow me to. I agreed with Yassine because my mother tongue is Arabic. So we decided to speak in our own language. I'm from La Plus, and I'm editor-in-chief of Doos, which means straightforward, going straight ahead. This, that means exactly the opposite of corruption. If there's a politician, who goes uh, straight, we say do's. And if he's not going straight, we say not do's. So it's, uh, this meaning is very broad for this word do's. We work in a, an area that we cover regularly. You hear about uh, Jerusalem, but we work in cities that are not spoken about, meaning Naplus, Abraham, and other cities. Hello, and thank you. I'm Roland Yatoubi Aziaka. I'm from Togo. I was born in a very small village by the Togo River called Keta Akoda. And uh, in the southern part of the maritime part of Togo, a very small, well, I had a passion for journalism when I was very young. So, I was born in a background that did not enable me to be able to have the necessary financial backing to go to a journalism school. So when I was in school, I was already very much interested in uh, issues covered at the radio. There was one program on the environment in particular, on radio, RTDS, and I followed it. I, since I, was, I loved it, I followed it, and I spoke as a, how do you would call that, as a participant and as a listener. I started that way. Already, I was in uh, two years before graduation. And when I called, the moderators say, who's that little girl with that little voice calling like that? But I was curious. I wanted to understand, because it was the first time that there was an interactive program on the environment on the media. 
I was very much moved. And one day they started a competition, a contest, a poetry contest to celebrate water, the World Water Day. And I took part as a pupil. And surprisingly, I was selected and I came in second. And they invited me to the very first time I was invited officially on the media to uh, get the price and they asked me questions. And that's how my adventure started in journalism. So I went and I must admit, it was very difficult at the beginning. Like in all countries, in our societies, it's not easy for a young woman, you know. I don't like to use the word poor, right? But when you come from a modest background, let's say, it's not easy to make your dream come true. So that's how I started. And finally, they allowed me to speak out as a pupil to give lessons on citizenships in schools. It started that way, and I pushed my passion forward. When I graduated, I couldn't afford to do anything else, so I did studied English at university. But I didn't stop. While I was at university, I asked for internships in the press. I started to become interested in the written media, and then I went with the daily newspaper. And the directors saw something special in me. They positioned me on issues regarding the environment. So I did news coverages, and I wrote about uh, citizenship, causes in the media, and then I went to television, from the written press to television. And I was uh, doing a press review, followed by a debate, and I also learned to do news coverages that were video. That's how it started, but what I lacked was a room to express myself as a woman, as a young woman, because the previous panel table on the media, that's what I experienced too. I felt frustrated that I didn't have any room to express myself. And that's where Echo Conscience TV started. I found it in digital. At the outset, I just used YouTube. I, I created a YouTube channel. That was in 2015 with the French Embassy. And I said, yeah, COP22. There's a lots of things about my in my country, lots of mobilization. At the time, they're already talking about uh, CDNs. What CDN? No one spoke about that. So I took my camera and I said, I will write and I to ask for an interview with you. Explain. What do you mean by CDN? That's how it started. And I managed the staff, and then the ambassador from the Embassy of France, and then the European Union, and then the German Embassy, and it created a big buzz. So with that, we said, no, it's important to have a media that is specialized on these matters in Togo, and to talk about it. And that's how it started, Ecoscience. So we reorgan keep the suspense for us, keep, stop there, stop there. Thank you. Um, good morning. If I decide to speak in French, uh, because if I speak in my, my mother tongue, it would be Amazir. And since we have no interpretation, I will use Arabic because it is also my mother tongue. I'm from Morocco, Marrakesh, and in that region, there are many people who speak Amazir only. It is the local language in the region. So, good morning, and welcome to all of you. Dear friends, my name is Mohamed Amassin al head of the Moroccan Citizen Initiatives Association, and I lead an association called Kasha Radio a very dynamic radio that started in Morocco. So 
with the Democratic Spring, the Arab Spring, that is. There were many initiatives uh, in the media so as to make the voices of young people heard when it comes to equality and human rights. That also was the case in Tunisia, which created a legal framework to protect these associations. In Morocco, there was a certain momentum. At the same time as our friends in Tunisia, Algeria, and Libya, and a new momentum was given to this initiative, an initiative called Cash Radio. At the time, I worked, well, I didn't work in the media. I was a student and researcher, a researcher in the university afterwards, and I was not at all interested in the media apart from these initiatives. I now consider that uh, news, social news platforms can foster democratic development because these platforms are very much interested in a citizen-based approach. It's like Phoenix morning once again from its ashes, so radio and radio again. So I decided to give a drive to that initiative on the radio, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. But my question is, your question is, have we changed things in society? Well, I would say that things are not linear, but rather circular. But we're still trying, and we still have high hopes. Shukran. When you speak about impact, you have short term, which is visible, the things that you can capture through stories, and then the longer term vision. Can you tell me? for what you were able to do in the months or years before that, and you felt that there was an impact. It can be two or three stories, but not too long. In terms of impact, it's up to the public to judge for us. But we also have an internal mechanism for assessing that impact. The media works with other sectors, and uh, the is interaction with the economic and political spheres. So we must always draft assessment reports on our impact. In Palestine, our social or societal makeup is a bit complicated. We have a parliament that hasn't been sitting for over 16 years. So the fact of not having an, an active parliament means that there's no one to represent citizens in this body that is there to represent citizens. As a result, the services we render to the public are incomplete. And the legislative and parliamentary organization are lacking. In Palestine, we have different districts or rural assemblies that manage our Palestinian citizens. We still try to offer services that are compatible with our political realities. For us, what's key is innovation. We all learned in journalism school that a journalist should only submit information. But in Palestine, we innovated, I believe, and we set up a school meeting citizens' needs. Because, in fact, journalism is a public service, isn't it? So we can't select 
topics that we um, deal with. So we set up services on the where we examine the Palestinian realities in lectures targeted for journalism, journalists and students. You will see that students will be present there too. Even the very young who will be uh, working in informal media. This is something we see more and more. But equality or the gender equality quantitatively is not something we have attained yet. We as a media institution, we train young people for them to learn by doing, to learn the job, and to learn how to practice this profession. Once they graduate, they will be recruited by the different telecommunication media. Right now, we have just over 750 graduates from our institution. With so generations, and I belong to that generation. It's a part of my own experience. I started as a student. Uh, once I finished, I worked as a reporter in, at that institution. They trained me, so they knew me well. After that, I worked as an editor 10 years later on. I'm editor-in-chief of the very institution where I was trained. So I'm a real product of that institution. So that's how it went for me. So I went all throughout the hierarchy. And that also applies to my colleagues, the director of video and production that have been working with us for over 10 years now. Most of them are graduates as well, and they work in neighboring Arab institutions. Secondly, with respect to relations between citizens and those who hold authority, those who hold authority, they're not held accountable because our parliament doesn't work, so no one is accountable since there's no parliament. So we organized public hearings, and that was a real innovation. Now it's something that is more widespread. So we decided to convene citizens with their leaders, but you don't convene them as if they were to go to a conference. We prepare citizens two or three months ahead of time. We start by publishing reports. We encourage citizens and we tell them that they probably hold more information than what is held by the leaders, that they have the knowledge, they have information. So at the end of these hearings, we have a very fruitful output. For example, about the water crisis that we have been experiencing in our region. We decided to organize a tribunal. The mayor didn't agree. He left the hearing. He didn't agree to be judged by uh, the people's jury. So later on, we convinced the citizens to return together with those who were in charge of that. We asked citizens to write their questions, and we would submit the questions to those in charge so that there would be uh, no uh, conflicts between both. And the output from that showed that we needed a new circulation policy in our region. The new policy was worse than the old one, but we did follow it, and we convened them once again to uh, correct the outputs because the results were not sufficient, so we reorganized circulation again. 
There are other areas, too, where we organize hearings like this. But I must say that we felt that journalists, while being totally ethical, could step in and have a real impact on society. That's journalism, participative democracy, right? On my side, I like to speak about personal impact and impact on society. As I explained before this, at the outset, it was an adventure that was structured. I was lucky to have been able to extend my thanks to the French embassy that supported me. We launched Eco Conscience TV as a media project that was citizen-driven in Togo. I like to stress the point that's very important, political support that I had at the time. The adventure all started in 2015 with the official launching with the backing of the European Union and the CAC service with support from the Ministry of Communication. And it is the minister himself who went that day. He came to launch the Echo Conscience TV at the EU delegation. And this backing made it possible for me to be credible as a young woman who was bold enough to launch a, a media institution. That wasn't obvious, especially with digital and, and the environment at the time. Now it has worked and we have become a model. At the time, I was interviewed on the radio and they said, but tell me, Roland, with the internet, do you think that your TV can work? I believed in my project. So I said, I'm looking towards the future. And I'm sure that in the future, the digital desert will be there, and we will be ready. And everything we have said, well, the future has shown that I was right. Today in Togo, I'm very happy to see young women launching media institutions via the digital technologies. That's at the personal level. Thanks to that, I too made my dream come true. I did a bachelor's degree in journalism thanks to a scholarship from ProfaMed, a program for a refresher training to upskill journalists in Togo, a program by the embassy uh, led by the Ministry of the Environment. Roland, we don't have too much time. We need to have some time for questions, so I have to stop you there. Well, we'll have to start the Q&A session with the audience first. Just one quick story on the impact. Impact. OK, go ahead. Yassine. OK, one minute. One minute maximum. The project, which we wanted to use to show that we had an impact, was that of a mobile radio. Instead of people going to a studio, the studio would reach out to citizens in rural areas, enabling women to speak about their difficulties in society. You know that in rural areas, women don't express themselves. So we offer that possibility to women, unfortunately, with a very s uh, small area. In terms of a broader impact, we preferred to focus on small villages. For example, we would talk about local products. products uh, from the region or village, and we'll allow them to speak about politics, and especially access to public services. Uh, so by this uh, 
uh, car that would travel throughout the land, we try to reach out to the most remote areas. My colleague was with me, and we recorded a program on the Esawira region, in particular in Marrakesh, my region. I was honored to be there with you. I won't uh, say too much because of the lack of time, but I urge you to go to Ekush Radio, and you'll see there's a lot of data there. And now we can start the Q&A session. It was a humanitarian experience that was exceptional. Congratulations and thank you. I have a quick question for you, Yasin. Was it a caravan for people to learn to do things, filming or short documentaries or getting testimonials? Getting testimonials and learning, teaching people to speak on the radio with the radio equipment, but we avoided filming people because for them, just speaking on the radio, and uh, we had a space for discussion before the program. That was important. I must also point out that since the minivan traveled throughout the region to offset CO2 emissions, we had to bring in palm trees and olive trees to be planted by women. And that was a very important goal. So the minivan also had a solar panel to avoid CO2 emissions. And luckily that Yasmin spoke about that. Yes, and the minivan is dangerous because once you get in there, you don't want to leave it. You feel, what am I doing in my radio studio? I love it here in my minivan in Morocco. It was a wonderful experience, and thanks to all of you because we can see how at your level, thanks to your initiatives, you can change and create an impact and promote awareness. Thanks so much for this very inspiring panel discussion. Let's move on to a Q&A session. A round of applause, please, they deserve it. Who wants to ask a question? Well done, Roland, once again. And Yasin as well. This is a very interesting initiative. I hope that we will be able to um, find some inspiration from it. I'm Reikan, I'm from, from Mauritania. And I uh, would have like you to talk about the Au Parleur. It's an initiative that made us change things at home. It means that now people are finding an interest in uh, gender issues, for instance, uh, women's rights issues, uh, gender equality. Mm, the media didn't used to talk about it, and we needed an initiative to be created in another country so that young Africans could be interested in this. And this initiative is now creating a, a space, a platform, where we share interesting, innovative videos. It gives opportunities. I'm talking about the haut parleur the speakers. I'm part of this francophone network, and one of the deans of the, this network. And that's allowed us in Mauritania and in other countries, in Senegal, Guinea, to make things happen to promote women's rights, to promote entrepreneurship, to uh, be able to talk about civic engagement. So well done and well done to uh, JALA as well. They're very relevant initiatives and they're very inspiring. Thank you and thank you for sharing these thoughts. I just wanted to say that, uh, yes, it can be frustrating, so you need to not give up to connect, to keep talking about it. I think that there's a question. Good morning and uh, well done. Congratulations. They're very rich initiatives, very inspiring. In France, we see that uh, media is fa facing more and more accusations. Sometimes uh, they are accused of 
uh, being activists. And we can see here that uh, you are stepping out this uh, role as informers, but we see that in certain countries it's not always well perceived and accepted. So I wanted to know in uh, the three national contexts, how was it perceived? So the question is, should uh, journalism be independent, fact-based, or should it be more of an activist work? Maybe we can start with Yasin, yes, thankfully. How is it perceived as well, if I understood it well? First of all, I'd like to highlight the fact that our project was done in partnership with CFI. I forgot to say it. it's very important, partnership with CFI. And it's the first time that we uh, conduct a perform an impact-based analysis. And, uh, we have a, a media genre that is a bit different. We are uh, an association, a community-based radio, so we already uh, active. We already committed, engaged with society. Our values promote the change of society. We promote democracy, uh, rights to equality. So that's our editorial line. That's what defines our editorial line. So we are engaged with society. We're not unbiased. We're not neutral. We have a message, goals that we want to reach a message that we want to convey. That's clear. And we are a citizen, community-based radio. To have access to uh, public spaces, well, it wasn't easy. There are procedures, because we are an association in the end. But most of the time, it's not an issue when uh, we are not addressing sensitive issues. But we want to promote some values, uh, and our target audience is women, girls in rural areas. So we start with insensitive issues. We talk about social and economic problems, problems of access to rights, to justice, to health at our level. Sometimes we have issues not with authorities, but with the male superiority, male domination in the territories. And that can be an issue because when you bring together women, only women, when you organize workshops, when you record shows, sometimes it can be an issue for the women themselves because recently there was an example of women who were not insulted, but um, who were being marginalized by their girlfriends because they wanted to talk on the radio because sometimes it's perceived as shameful, but it allowed other women to uh, present themselves to elections and to have access to uh, uh, an important position uh, higher up. Uh, a position higher up in the hierarchy. but So we, we're mobilized. We have a very specific dynamic in our association. We are starting a different phase in our media. It's a civic tech adventure. And the, one of the, particip the participants are from Connections, Connection Citoyenne 2 from CFI, and that allowed me to have a citizen participatory, participatory platform in Togo with a mobile platform. So we launched it on the 9th of February this year, and currently we are engaging citizens and the local authorities. That's a new adventure for me. When we launched the application, the, the citizens uh, welcomed it and adhered to it. 
and it's well perceived in uh, Togo at the moment. Today, Ecoconscience is the first civic tech media in Togo officially. And in the upcoming years, we want to become a hyphen between the, co the grassroots communities, the local elected people, and the financial partners. The question is asked off mic and cannot be heard by interpreters. One last question. We could uh, make the debate last longer, but we're, we're going, going to take two questions in a row. Gaston. I'm Gaston Sordreau. I come from Burkina Faso, and I'm a journalist. Congratulations to our three speakers. Regarding my two friends from Togo and Morocco, I felt that it wasn't necessarily about journalism, but more about activism, which allows me to ask this question. What is your relationship with journalists? Because listening to you, I felt that you were more activist than journalist. A short answer, maybe, that will be simpler, and then I'll give you the floor. Do you want to answer? Uh, the speaker, it's off mic, so the interpreters cannot hear the comment. This is a, a legitimate question. We criticize the people who are blocking the media, the uh, some charities and some uh, civil society organizations might interfere in their work. So what is the line that shouldn't be crossed? When are we going to be, when are we going to be activists or not? We've got two principles. There's a published and a, a written editorial line, and that's where uh, we are um, considered as journalists. And then there's a code of ethics, code of conduct is very much detailed and it explains what we can do and what we can't do. So for instance, if we were to visit a village, as a journalist, I can't interview uh, an underage child without having the parents' agreement. So there are red lines that shouldn't be crossed, certain pictures that can't publish. For instance, in Palestine, uh, there are conflicts, and we cannot publish pictures with blood on it. So this editorial line is going to be your Bible, our Quran, and it will be our guideline. That's for the editorial line. The local context can differ from one journalist to another. For instance, a doctor practicing medicine can be different in Egypt and in France. In certain hospitals, the doctor will be in charge of welcoming patients, and that the same for us. since. There is a significant political gap. The journalists must adapt to the society's needs. Journalism is not just about writing reports. There is a charter that we must abide by. And if one day, for instance, I don't comply with one of the articles of this charter, then I will be put aside. What's important today is that we're currently trying to make uh, associative association journalism more institutionalized. At the moment, there are lots of volunteers who come from associations and who are producing contents on social networks. And on the other hand, there's professional journalism. We're also trying to create our uh, media genre 
and we're trying to go towards a citizen journalism. It's a process. We're just starting. It's not easy. That's why we don't need to wonder what is the link, what is the rupture. We need to uh, talk about how we complete each other and uh, the type of journalism for uh, associations or uh, for regulatory media. That's not yet defined. We need to uh, design it together with professional journalism, with uh, um, volunteers, with experts, so that we create this. But we are activists, that's true. I just want to add that today that, yes, some initiatives can rise in activism, but we are a media company, a media outlet that receives, uh, recruits people who are graduating from the School of Journalism. We have an editorial charter, and with our project, with citizen, uh, our citizen participatory project, there is an editorial line, editorial charter. We. Uh, comply with journalistic rules. But today, we have seen today that journalism must be able to be at the core of new dynamics today. It's not just a traditional type of journalism. You go somewhere, you report, you come back, and you publish it, and that's where it stops. I believe in a development journalism, and we must work on this, must encourage this. Thank you, Roland. Room one is uh, about to join us to um, then listen to the GFMD uh, actions and Tom Law, who's going to give a speech about it. So we will start in two to three minutes. We'll take one last question. Thank you. My name is Brice Mono, Vice President of the largest uh, diaspora platform in France. With CFI at the beginning of March, we organized two Media and Migration Days. The first question that uh, we addressed was, do you continue talking about how we are very much delayed and not in time? We don't talk about what is done in a positive way in the media. When you're supported to train journalism, that's a quest second question, do you adapt it? Do you do it together so that you adapt the training depending on the social dynamics present in the country so that it is more performant? There are always uh, orders in France. The journalists say it's an order from uh, the government, from the European Commission. But when you report to your governments, aren't you worried that you're going to be influenced by the specific supports. Comment off mic. The second question, question is more of a debate, but the first question do you feel that uh, the diaspora is messages being relayed? No, that wasn't the question. I'll try. It's not easy to answer. In sociology, we say uh, there's a day sociology, but no night sociology. There's poor people sociology, but no bourgeois people sociology. That's true. We cover topical issues. And I'm going to answer the second question at the same time. I think that in our countries, we are not diagnosing enough or lacking statistics to be able to cover uh, issues we need investigations, field investigations, and community-based um, community media need uh, this, uh, this data. 
there are lots of institutions, for instance, in France or in European countries in general, but we're m missing these types of diagnosis. In our project, we chose to uh, study, have a diagnosis study with women through workshops at the beginning, and that's not easy. That's what we need to recommend as well. We need to have observatories. We need scientific production institutions. We need figures, statistics at the local level, at the municipality level, at the city level. And I'm going to give the example of Porto Alegre in Brazil. There is a local institution that is producing data. And of course, this data can then be used for the media or for the decision makers. I'd like to add that in my case, I'm more about, I'm working in a type of journalism that is trying to find solutions. And today, with climate change and climate emergency, the three pillars of sustainable development, social, environmental, and economic pillars, dias the diaspora has a key role to play. Our diaspora is at um, the core of many initiatives. And today, we need to highlight this and change the narratives to write it again and to share the positive impact. And to talk about uh, the cross mobility between the diaspora and the local populations. Maybe we can conclude. Well, I think that we can ask people about their dream. What is their dream? Yes, indeed, we, we, that's what drives us, what we dream about. But regarding journalism, we want also to mention the problems that uh, journalist institutions are suffering from. We are losing trust from people, and you can, everyone can go on TikTok and post things when we spend hours and hours writing a report, for instance. So that means that trust here is uh, losing ground, and the alternatives are not necessarily better. They're just easier. And the young generations are looking for simple things, easy things. And if my, I have a dream, I would like people to find some trust in journalism, in journalists. And I truly hope that we are going to be able to uh, meet this target in the near future and that we gain more trust in journalists. Thank you very much. Merci, Roland. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Yassine. And thank you for uh, your comments, for having mentioned the positive impact of your initiatives.